Okay, we're going with it. Good morning. It is, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. It is good to see you all on this beautiful Sunday morning and to welcome you to worship at Browns Point United Methodist Church. I want to welcome our guests from uh, Winthrop who are escaping the smoke and fire. So our hearts and prayers are with you and all who are experiencing wildfire smoke and all of that danger. Um, and so let's keep our uh, brothers and sisters in our prayers. Um, I want to just share a joy that we had a great turnout at the food bank. Thank you to everyone who helped. Um, again, it's on the second and third Thursdays of the month. We're getting food, second and fourth, sorry, second and fourth, thank you, second and fourth uh, Thursdays of the month. Um, we're getting food from St. Leo's Food Bank, which comes from the Emergency Food Network. Um, and it's great, to, like, to just to be able to serve again. We had, uh, I think, Constance, uh, do you remember how many families? It was like it was closer to like 90. So we served about 90, like 90 people in families. So um, I don't know the like particular car vehicles that we saw, but it was uh, such a great, great time serving. So thank you um, for all your prayers and support of that ministry as well. Just trying to think if there's anything else for the good of the order. I do want to just make a quick note. You're watching the news. The Delta variant is scary. Um, we're all doing our part. That's why we're wearing masks today to make sure that uh, we're going to uh, take care of one another and keep each other safe uh, as much as possible, even though most of us are vaccinated. Um, but let us continue to do our part to help our brothers and sisters and to stop the spread of COVID-19. All right, let us center ourselves. <sighs> You're here, you made it. God is here. God's beautiful creatures are with us worshiping and it is good to be in the house of the Lord. So let us receive this beautiful song, You Are My Hiding Place. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, please join me in the call to worship. We gather in the name of the living Christ to worship God. God is in this place and calls us to worship in spirit and in truth. God's love is for you and for all people everywhere that we may share God's life, love, and spirit of the living Christ. The living Christ is with us. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. Please uh, stay seated. <laughs> <laughs> Almost forgot. Uh, opening hymn, We Are Standing on Holy Ground.
for the opening prayer. O God of Jacob, you speak in the light of day and in the dark of night. When our sleeping is filled with dreams of heaven and earth, may Jacob's vision remind us to be open and watchful, ready to discover your presence in our midst. Amen. Prayer of illumination. Holy God, enlighten us by your Holy Spirit and reveal yourself to us here in this place so that we may hear your word and proclaim your good news in the world. Amen. The Old Testament reading this morning is Genesis 28, 10 through 22. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. He reached a certain place and spent the night there. When the sun had set, he took one of the stones at that place and put it near his head. Then he lay down there. He dreamed, and he saw a raised staircase, its foundation on earth and its top touching the sky, and God's messengers were ascending and descending on it. Suddenly, the Lord was standing on it and saying, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will become like the dust of the earth. You will spread out to the west 
east, north, and south. Every family of earth will be blessed because of you and your descendants. I am with you now. I will protect you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave until I have done everything that I have promised you. When Jacob woke from his sleep, he thought to himself, the Lord definitely is in this place, but I did not know it. He was terrified and thought, the sacred place is awesome. It's none other than God's house, an entrance to heaven. After Jacob got up early in the morning, he took the stone that he had put near his head, set it up as a sacred pillar, and poured oil on top of it. He named the sacred place Bethel, though Luz was the city's original name. Jacob made a solemn promise, if God is with me and protects me, oops, sorry, <laughs> on this trip, I'm taking, I am taking, and gives me bread to eat and clothes to wear, and I have returned safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God. This stone that I've set up as a sacred pillar will be God's house, and everything you give me, I will give back a tenth to you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If you have ever been hiking, you know that there are special stone markers that are often put out to help travelers find the path and to stay safe until they finally reach their destination. You may know them by their official name, Cairns, which come from the Scottish Gaelic word. Sometimes we come across another set of stone markers that are not necessarily used for guidance along a path. Instead, the stone just seems to mark a spot, and you can tell that somebody put it there. Now, these stones can be found anywhere from uh, the city to out in nature to, or even along a shoreline. In her book, An Altar in the World, Episcopalian priest and theologian Barbara Brown Taylor invites us to see these formations as an announcement that something significant happened in this place and someone was affected by it. She calls them altars in the world. When we come across altars like these, we may never know what happened to the person there or what they encountered. But at that spot, we know what it is called, Bethel, the house of God. Now, Jews and Christians are familiar with this tradition of marking places with a stone to remember something significant, maybe even transformative, that has happened there. This spiritual practice started in the earliest book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, with one of our great ancestors, Jacob. His life and his experience teaches us to anticipate God in the most unlikely and ordinary of places, because in reality, the whole world world is God's house. For Bethel is the place where our ancestor Jacob encountered God in a dream, where he saw and experienced something that changed his life forever, God's ladder between heaven and earth. There in that spot, he received promises and assurances from God that he would be with him always. Now, when you encounter something like that, you cannot help but to mark the ordinary patch of earth with a stone to let others know that they are standing on holy ground. Before we even get to Jacob's dream of God's ladder and the assurances from God, we need to remember what brought Jacob to that place. In today's text, we find our protagonist, Jacob, on the run from his family, which has just imploded, and it's all his fault. Jacob tricked his father Isaac into giving him his older uh, twin brother Esau's blessing and birthright as the firstborn. Even his mother Rebekah was in on the scheme. The plan worked until Esau found out, and lo and behold, he was less than pleased. Actually, Esau wanted to kill his brother Jacob. But his mother, Rebecca, tells him to run in order to save both of her sons. 
So Jacob runs from home with little more than the clothes on his back. Now, hearing all of that, we silently admit we don't like Jacob that much. We roll our eyes and shake our heads as we think about all the ways he mistreated his twin brother and exploited his father, Isaac. I mean, how could Jacob grab and scheme like that to his own flesh and blood? Well, the reality is he's living up to what his name means, grabber. His parents named him Jacob because he came out of the womb grabbing onto his brother Esau's heel. Maybe his parents should have named him something else in order to avoid this terrible act. But what's interesting is all of his scheming did not lead to a life of luxury or status or whatever he was hoping to get. Instead, he is now a homeless runaway in the midst of the wilderness with no one to turn to for help. Secretly, we cannot help but think self-righteously he got what he deserved. His troubles are entirely of his own making. When Jacob had walked as far as he could, he stopped to rest for the night, but there was no town nearby, leaving him to rely on God's creation to provide and protect him while he sleeps. He lays down, taking one of the stones of the place and put it under his head and laid down in that place. As he closes his eyes, we would hope his desolation would actually wake him up to the terrible things he's done. Maybe he can't fall asleep or rest because he's racked with guilt, uh, knowing that he needs to ask for repentance or an ask for forgiveness, knowing that he did a terrible act of betraying his brother and family. But that's not what we get in this ordinary no-name place. Jacob's not remorseful. He's just tired and terrified as he closes his eyes. Instead, it's God who reaches out first to Jacob through a dream of a ladder set on top of the earth, reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. The dream of God's ladder touching the earth discloses a hidden yet very active presence of God in the world. In the dream, Jacob sees divine errand runners continually ascending and descending to do God's work in the world. This is shocking to us. Why would God choose to disclose this good news to this backstabber and thief? He's not deserving of such a gift. Then we think, well, maybe God has come to yell at him for what he's done, demand remorse and repentance to begin restoration and reconciliation for the family. But that's not actually what God is doing. This is the power of God's ladder. God chooses where it lands in the world and chooses to reveal uh, God's hidden divine activity to whoever God chooses. And while we would think God would pick more popular places and more wholesome figures, God picks that place and he picks Jacob. This is what God's ladder reveals to us, that God's grace is not contingent on our deserving. I'm going to say it one more time because I know someone needs to hear it this morning. That God's ladder reveals that God's grace is not contingent on our deserving. There are no conditions to God's love. Because God's love will never stop working on us to become more faithful and loving members of God's family. The way that God invites Jacob to be more loving and faithful is by offering him two promises. Soon Jacob's dream transitions from seeing God's ladder to seeing God standing beside him. The first promise he offers to Jacob is that God wants to continue the covenant he started with his grandfather, Abraham. God informs him, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your offspring, and your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. And you'll spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and all the families of the earth shall be blessed by you and your offspring. Despite everything Jacob has done, God accepts him as this next partner in the covenant. Now, the second promise is one of assurance, of divine accompany on his journey and the assurance of his return as well. Essentially, God says, I will protect and provide for you in every way so that one day you can return home. God promises not to leave him until these promises have been fulfilled. What an incredible and gracious vow. Again, Jacob has done nothing to deserve these gifts, these assurances, and these promises to God. In this moment, the dream of God's ladder and God's presence takes Jacob from where he was to where God needs him to be. 
looking at this story, we cannot help but be a little uncomfortable with God's overwhelming grace and generosity to Jacob. It can feel even downright offensive. God's unconditional love and grace runs smack into our understanding of the world that you should get what you deserve. If you make poor choices, then you should suffer the consequences. If you make plans at the last minute, don't be surprised that your options are limited or things don't work out. We want the assurance that those of us who do right get the right reward. And we want to be confident that those who act wrong will suffer the consequences or be punished accordingly. The reality is we are living in this dynamic right now between the vaccinated and unvaccinated. In the past few weeks, I cannot tell you enough how many private conversations I've had with people who have asked, how do I treat those who are unvaccinated? Now, for the sake of my sermon, I'm not talking about people who want to get vaccinated and are unable to because they're allergic to the ingredients or they're unable to because of health restrictions or because they just don't have one for that age group yet. We are talking about human beings who willingly choose not to get the vaccine, even though they could. The truth is, you know these people. They're your next door neighbor, a family member, a lifelong friend, or even a stranger you've never met before. Many people right now feel betrayed by their fellow human beings for not doing their part to stop COVID-19. Many people feel it's like their birthright and blessing of life has been stolen from them. Vaccinated people are now forced to care for family members because they refuse to get the vaccine. People are praying for their friends because they're in hospital on a ventilator because they didn't believe in getting the vaccine. So what are we supposed to do? There's so much anger because we want everyone to get vaccinated who can so that life can return to normal and that we can protect our most vulnerable. It can feel frustrating that people are only thinking about themselves and not the immune compromised. And I don't know about you, but it's hard watching night after night of another story of someone who didn't believe in getting the vaccine, but then spent months in the hospital and now are saying, I wish I got vaccinated and encouraging others to do the same. I don't know if you're wrestling with this, but I think we have to ask ourselves, how would God treat the unvaccinated? Would God withhold love and grace to them? Healing and care? No, of course not. But that is what Jesus came to earth to teach all of us as well. There is no limit to God's unconditional love and grace, even while we would try to put limits on it. Through his parable of the prodigal son, or better known as the loving father, Jesus reminds us that God's love is both and, not either or. Famous preacher Fred Craddock explains that the embrace of the younger son did not mean the rejection of the older. The love of tax collectors and sinners does not negate the love of Pharisees and scribes. Such is God's love. But we find it difficult not to be offended by God's grace toward another, especially if we have serious questions about that person's conduct and character. This is why. This is why those in power arrested Jesus and hung him on the cross. They were so offended that God's love was that gracious, inclusive, and unconditional. But even as Jesus hung on the cross, we know he demonstrated that never-ending love and grace as he prayed for those who persecuted him, asking God to forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. And on that Saturday, Sunday morning, we know that God set a stone upon the earth upon the world to mark the spot that God's unconditional love met and known through Jesus had defeated death once and for all. That that open stone tomb reminded the world that Jesus was alive and his love would never be for just a select few. It would be for the deserving and undeserving. It would be for all. So then we ask ourselves the harder question, can we love the unvaccinated the way God does? Could we love the unvaccinated like we love and appreciate the vaccinated? For the truth is, none of us are perfect either. And let's be honest, we too have made reckless choices in our lives that we would rather not remember at this moment. Maybe they were reckless choices that put others' lives at risk too. But no matter what we did, God still loves us. That nothing we did in the past ever stopped God from providing and protecting us. 
God never saw us as our worst mistake. But can we do that now for our fellow human beings? You see, in order to understand the power of God's gracious promises, it is worth noting that those promises did have an effect on Jacob and his self-centered, scheming, grabbing, usurping behavior. Immediately upon waking, he realizes that the ordinary place he has laid his head is anything but ordinary. It is the house of God. And in classic Jacob manner, he makes a conditional vow and response. If God will be with me and will keep me in this way, I will go. And I will give, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And all that you give me, I surely give one-tenth to you. The thing is... We want God's unconditional love and grace to work like a magic wand. We want to see change instantaneously. But the truth is, it won't be t until 20 years after Jacob's first encounter with God at Bethel that he returns home with his family, with flocks and herds. And this time, 20 years later, he prays a different prayer. This time, he doesn't bargain with God. He only acknowledges his own unworthiness and God's faithfulness. You see, this change is not Jacob's doing. It's God's doing. God's unconditional love and grace has transformed his life from a callow youth to a man who founds the nation Israel and who on his deathbed claims that the God of Abraham and Isaac is also his God, who has been his shepherd all his life to this day. That's the power of God's ladder touching earth. It reminds us that God's grace is not contingent on our deserving and never will. Nothing can separate us from God's love, no matter how reckless we are with our lives, nor how our fellow beings are being reckless with their lives. God never gives up on us to become more faithful, loving members of God's family. And maybe we shouldn't give up on our fellow human beings as well. And anywhere where we are reminded of this truth that God's love is truly unconditional, we should definitely stop and mark the place as holy ground. Amen? Let us join now in the prayers of the people. You may have heard that the city of Tacoma is considering a uh, empty lot near the Norpoint uh, golf course to be, uh, my understanding is homeless shelter. Uh, I don't know enough about it yet, but I think we should just pray for this situation. It's already heating up a lot of emotions. Um, and as people of God who believe that all people should be sheltered, we want to find the best solution possible for our brothers and sisters in need. So let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we pray for our city as they discern how to take care of our brothers and sisters who are homeless. Lord, 
We ask for your wisdom and your guidance. We ask for our hearts to be open, to be participants in helping our brothers and sisters find homes, find shelter. Lord, we want to find the best place possible. And so God, we ask you to move in this time. God, we know too that any time that the, this topic comes up in our community, there's always fear. As people are scared, as they don't have enough information, as stereotypes are exacerbated and played out. So God, we pray for the transformation of our community, that we can continue to be a place of love, a place of welcome, knowing that no one is their worst mistake, knowing that we must become aware of our own unconscious biases, and we must work together to address this housing situation for our homeless brothers and sisters. Lord, in your mercy, God, today, our state enacts laws that are meant to help policing. And again, there is so much raw emotion and fear and hope all mixed in at once. And it has direct implications in our church. Our beloved Monica and Johnny are in charge of the training for police officers. And they are experiencing heightened levels of racism, heightened levels of aggression, heightened levels of fear. So God be with them as they lead in this season we pray for our sheriffs and our police chiefs. We pray for our community to come together to find true solutions so that we can do right by all of your people. We pray this, Lord, in your mercy. God, we pray. Lord, we are frustrated. We are scared. And we are worried about this COVID-19 Delta variant. We're deeply heartbroken to see cases rising again, wanting our fellow human beings to take care of themselves, to take care of their neighbor and their loved one. But God, this is not a time when we should diminish the value of our fellow human being by the choices they make. We should not speak negatively of them, but continue to treat everyone like a child of God. For you have showed us the power of grace and love, that it does do wonderful, transformative things in people's lives. So yes, while we may be angry and frustrated, Help us to continue to choose love and grace. Lord, in your mercy. God, we just want to say thank you to all of the doctors and nurses and the respiratory therapists uh, and the hospital staffs that are doing amazing jobs caring for all of these patients. Remind them, O oh Lord, that they're not alone and that you are with them and that they are so deeply loved and appreciated by their fellow human beings. Lord, in your mercy. God, we pray for our community of faith and those who are in need of your healing touch. We especially pray for Dick and Lois's great-granddaughter, who uh, Kira, who is healing. We pray for Carol Novotny, David Warren, Julie Fieser, Diane McQueen, we pray for Todd Peterson. We t pray for Paul's sister, Susie. And we pray for Maureen and Marty who wanted to be here, but couldn't. 
We pray for all who just need you, O Lord, this day, who need that assurance that you are with them always. Lord, in your mercy. God, we take this moment to silently lift up what we need to lift up to you today, whether those are confessions or prayers of thanksgiving and gratitude or sorrow and concern. We lift them up to you silently now. God, how could we forget? How could we ever forget your unconditional love towards us? And how could we forget to extend that to our fellow human beings? Help us, O oh Lord. Continue to choose love and grace in all aspects of our lives. And the people of God said, Amen. At this time, uh, we bless the offering. Again, um, we have the offering spot on the table as we're unable to pass the plate uh, due to COVID. Um, and again, you're still welcome to uh, mail in your gift or submit it online. And again, we just are so grateful for your generosity in this season um, so that we can continue to be the hands and feet of Christ in our community. So with that, let us give thanks to God. Generous God, you call us to follow you, to give, give to you from our resources generously and willingly. May these gifts enable your good work to be done in our community, our nation, and throughout the world. In the name of Jesus, amen. At this time, uh, we're going to participate in the sacrament of Holy Communion. If you don't have one, Maggie Jolly is at the back table. would love to get you uh, the sacrament. You know, as we are talking about deserving and undeserving, I wonder, you know, sometimes, depending on our mood, would we have restricted certain people from the Lord's table? Would Judas have made the cut knowing he was about to betray him and give him into the hands of the authorities. But it, what, that's what's a, so remarkable about Jesus is that he always welcomed everyone. And so we partake of this meal to remember the inclusiveness, the expansiveness of God's love and God's grace is at this meal. So on the night in which Jesus 
gave himself up for us. He took the bread, gave thanks to God, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often um, in remembrance of me. And so now we partake of the bread and the cup. If you've never uh, used these before, you're going to take the top layer off and you'll get the wafer and then you'll take the bottom layer and receive the cup. So the body and blood of Christ is given for you. God, we give thanks that you are never playing those games that we would rather play amongst our fellow human beings. You never look at us as whether we deserve or not deserve. But sometimes we realize that it has held us back from coming to your table because we don't think we're worthy of your love. But once more, you nourish us in body and mind and spirit through the bread and the cup to remind us it's not about us it's about who you are you are our god and we are your people and you love us right here right now and all we can do is say thank you as we join together saying the prayer that jesus taught us to pray our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you are uh, able, um, in body and spirit, please rise and uh, let us join in our closing hymn. It may be a little newer to you, uh, but I believe you will be able to catch on. It's in the bulletin as a loose leaf.
quick announcements. Again, if you can help with Chris Sergianko's uh, memorial service celebration of life on Saturday, August 7th, we would greatly appreciate it. Be here at 9 a.m. Uh, we're going to put out chairs for the guests uh, rather than ask them to bring their own. Um, and then after service today, we'd love some help. If you can help take down these three canopies, uh, that'd be great. I just want to say uh, thank you to Carrie and Dave for securing this third one. Uh, so let's just give a clap praise to God for them. So we are grateful. All right, go in peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And remember that God's love is unconditional, that God's grace is ever expansive. Amen? Amen. Amen.